Chapter Eighteen of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Eighteen. I go away on service, am wounded and taken prisoner with O'Brien, diamond cut diamond between the O'Briens get into comfortable quarters my first interview with celeste and now i have to relate an event which young as i was at the time will be found to have seriously affected me in after life how little do we know what to-morrow may bring forth we had regained our station and for some days had been standing off and on the coast when one morning at daybreak we found ourselves about four miles from the town of set and a large convoy of vessels coming round a point we made all sail in chase and they anchored close in shore under a battery which we did not discover until it opened fire upon us the shot struck the frigate two or three times for the water was smooth and the battery nearly level with it the captain tacked the ship and stood out again until the boats were hoisted out and all ready to pull on shore and storm the battery o'brien who was the officer commanding the first cutter on service was in his boat and i again obtained permission from him to smuggle myself into it we ran on shore amidst the fire of gunboats which protected the convoy by which we lost three men and made for the battery which we took without opposition the french artillerymen running out as we ran in the first lieutenant who commanded desired o'brien to remain with the first cutter and after the armourer had spiked the guns as officer of the boat he was to shove off immediately o'brien and i remained in the battery with the armourer the boat's crew being ordered down to the boat to keep her afloat and ready to shove off at a moment's warning we had spiked all the guns but one when all of a sudden a volley of musketry was poured upon us which killed the armourer and wounded me in the leg above the knee i fell down by o'brien who cried out by the powers here they are and one gun not spiked he jumped down wrenched the hammer from the armourer's hand and seizing a nail from the bag in a few moments he had spiked the gun at this time i heard the tramping of the french soldiers advancing when o'brien threw away the hammer and lifting me upon his shoulders cried come along peter my boy and made for the boat as fast as he could but he was too late he had not got half way to the boat before he was collared by two french soldiers and dragged back into the battery the french troops then advanced and kept up a smart fire our cutter escaped and joined the other boat who had captured the gunboats and convoy with little opposition our large boats had carronades mounted in their bows and soon returned the fire with round and grape which drove the french troops back into the battery where they remained popping at our men under cover until most of the vessels were taken out those which they could not man were burnt in the meantime o'brien had been taken into the battery with me on his back but as soon as he was there he laid me gently down saying peter my boy as long as you were under my charge i'd carry you through thick and thin but now that you are under the charge of these french beggars why let them carry you every man his own bundle peter that's fair play so if they think you're worth the carrying then let them bear the weight of you as soon as our boats were clear of their musketry the commanding officer of the french troops examined the guns in the battery with the hope of reaching them and was very much annoyed to find that every one of them was spiked he looks sharper than a magpie before he finds a clear touch hole i expect said o'brien as he watched the officer and here i must observe that o'brien showed great presence of mind in spiking the last gun for had they had one gun to fire at our boats towing out the prizes they must have done a great deal of mischief to them and we should have lost a great many men but in so doing and in the attempt to save me he sacrificed himself and was taken prisoner when the troops ceased firing the commanding officer came up to o'brien and looking at him said officer to which brian nodded his head then he pointed to me officer o'brien nodded his head again at which the french troops laughed as o'brien told me afterwards because i was what they called an enfant which means an infant i was very stiff and faint and could not walk the officer who commanded the troops left a detachment in the battery and prepared to return to set from whence they came o'brien walked and i was carried on three muskets by six of the french soldiers not a very pleasant conveyance at any time but in my state excessively painful however i must say that they were very kind to me and put a great coat or something under my wounded leg for i was in agony and fainted several times at last they brought me some water to drink oh how delicious it was 
in about an hour and a half which appeared to me to be five days at the least we arrived at the town of set and i was taken up to the house of the officer who commanded the troops and who had often looked at me as i was carried there from the battery saying pauvre enfant i was put on a bed where i again fainted away when i came to my senses i found a surgeon had bandaged my leg and that i had been undressed o'brien was standing by me and i believed that he had been crying for he thought i was dead when i looked him in the face he said peter you baste how you frightened me bad luck to me if ever i take charge of another youngster what did you sham dead for i am better now o'brien replied i how much i am indebted to you you have been made a prisoner in trying to save me i have been made prisoner in doing my duty in one shape or another i squeezed the offered hand of o'brien and looked round me the surgeon stood at one side of the bed and the officer who commanded the troops at the other at the head of the bed was a little girl about twelve years old who held a cup in her hand out of which something had been poured down my throat i looked at her and she had such pity in her face which was remarkably handsome that she appeared to me as an angel and i turned round as well as i could that i might look at her alone she offered me the cup which i should have refused from any one but her and i drank a little another person then came into the room and a conversation took place in french i wonder what they mean to do with us said i to o'brien whist hold your tongue replied he and then he leaned over me and said in a whisper i understand all they say don't you recollect i told you that i learnt the language after i was killed and buried in the sand in south america after a little more conversation the officer and the others retired leaving nobody but the little girl and o'brien in the room it's a message from the governor said o'brien as soon as they were gone wishing prisoners to be sent to jail in the citadel to be examined and the officer says and he's a real gentleman as far as i can judge that you're but a baby and badly wounded in the bargain and that it would be a shame not to leave you to die in peace so i presume that i'll part company from you very soon oh i hope not o'brien replied i if you go to prison i will go also for i will not leave you who are my best friend to remain with strangers i should not be half so happy although i might have more comforts in my present situation peter my boy i'm glad to see that your heart is in the right place as i always thought it was or i wouldn't have taken you under my protection we'll go together to prison my jewel and i'll fish at the bars with a bag and a long string just by way of recreation and to pick up a little money to buy you all manner of nice things and when you get well you shall do it yourself mayhap you'll have better luck as peter your namesake had who was a fisherman before you but somehow or another i think we mayn't be parted yet for i heard the officer who appears to be a real gentleman and worthy to have been an irishman born say to the other that he asked the governor for me to stay with you on parole until you are well again the little girl handed me the lemonade of which i drank a little and then i felt very faint again i laid my head on the pillow and o'brien having left off talking i was soon in a comfortable sleep in an hour i was awakened by the return of the officer who was accompanied by the surgeon the officer addressed o'brien in french who shook his head as before two other persons then came into the room one of them addressed o'brien in very bad english saying that he was interpreter and would beg him to answer a few questions he then inquired the name of our ship number of guns and how long we had been cruising after that the force of the english fleet and a great many other questions relative to them all of which were put in french by the person who came with him and the answers translated and taken down in a book some of the questions o'brien answered correctly to others he pleaded ignorance and to some he asserted what was not true but i did not blame him for that as it was his duty not to give information to the enemy at last they asked my name and rank which o'brien told them was i noble yes replied o'brien don't say so o'brien interrupted i peter you know nothing about it you are grandson to a lord i know that but still i am not noble myself although descended from him therefore pray don't say so bother peter i have said it and i won't unsay it besides peter recollect it's a french question and in france you would be considered noble at all events it can do no harm i feel too ill to talk o'brien but i wish you had not said so then they inquired o'brien's name which he told them his rank in the service and also whether he was noble i am an o'brien replied he and pray what's the meaning of the o before my name if i'm not noble however 
mr interpreter you may add that we have dropped our title because it's not convenient the french officer burst out into a loud laugh which surprised us very much the interpreter had great difficulty in explaining what o'brien said but as o'brien told me afterwards the answer was put down doubtful they all left the room except the officer who then to our astonishment addressed us in good english gentlemen i have obtained permission from the governor for you to remain in my house until mr simple is recovered mr o'brien it is necessary that i should receive your parole of honour that you will not attempt to escape are you willing to give it o'brien was quite amazed murder an irish cried he so you speak english colonel i'm of irish descent replied the officer and my name as well as yours is o'brien i was brought up in this country not being permitted to serve my own and retain the religion of my forefathers but to the question mr o'brien will you give your parole the word of an irishman in the hand to boot replied o'brien shaking the colonel by hand and you are more than doubly sure for i'll never go away and leave little peter here and as for carrying him on my back i've had enough of that already it is sufficient replied the colonel mr o'brien i will make you as comfortable as i can and when you are tired of attending your friend my little daughter shall take your place you'll find her a kind little nurse mr simple i could not refrain from tears at the colonel's kindness he shook me by the hand and telling o'brien that dinner was ready he called up his daughter the little girl who had attended me before and desired her to remain in the room celeste said he you understand a little english quite enough to find out what he is in want of go and fetch your work to amuse yourself when he is asleep celeste went out and returning with her embroidery sat down by the head of the bed the colonel and o'brien then quitted the room celeste then commenced her embroidery and as her eyes were cast down upon her work i was able to look at her without her observing it as i said before she was a very beautiful little girl her hair was light brown eyes very large and eyebrows drawn as with a pair of compasses her nose and mouth was also very pretty but it was not so much her features as the expression of her countenance which was so beautiful so modest so sweet and so intelligent when she smiled which she almost always did when she spoke her teeth were like two rows of little pearls i had not looked at her long before she raised her eyes from her work and perceiving that i was looking at her said you want something want drink i speak very little english no i thank ye replied i i only want to go to sleep then shut your eye replied she smiling and she went to the window and drew down the blinds to darken the room in the evening the surgeon called again he felt my pulse and directing cold applications to my leg which had swelled considerably and was becoming very painful told colonel o'brien that although i had considerable fever i was doing as well as could be expected under the circumstances but i shall not dwell upon my severe sufferings for a fortnight after which the ball was extracted nor upon how carefully i was watched by o'brien the colonel and little celeste during my peevishness and irritation arising from pain and fever End of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Nineteen. We remove to very unpleasant quarters. Birds of a feather won't always flock together. O'Brien cuts a cutter midshipman and gets a taste of French steel altogether flat work as soon as i was well enough to attend to my little nurse we became very intimate as might be expected in five weeks i was out of bed and could limp about the room before two months were over i was quite recovered the colonel however would not report me to the governor i remained on a sofa during the day but at dusk i stole out of the house and walked about with celeste i never passed such a happy time as the last fortnight the only drawback was a remembrance that I should soon have to exchange it for a prison. I was more easy about my father and mother, as O'Brien had written to them assuring them that I was doing well. And besides, a few days after our capture, the frigate had run in and sent a flag of truce to inquire if we were alive or made prisoners. At the same time, Captain Savage sent on shore all our clothes and two hundred dollars in cash for our use. 
i knew that even if o'brien's letter did not reach them they were sure to hear from captain savage that i was doing well at the end of twelve weeks the surgeon could no longer withhold his report and we were ordered to be ready in two days to march to toulon where we were to join another party of prisoners to proceed with them into the interior i must pass over our parting which the reader may imagine was very painful i promised to write to celeste and she promised that she would answer my letters if it were permitted we shook hands with colonel o'brien thanking him for his kindness and much to his regret we were taken in charge by two french cuirassiers who were waiting at the door as we preferred being continued on parole until our arrival at toulon the soldiers were not at all particular about watching us and we set off on horseback o'brien and i going first and the french cuirassiers following us in the rear the evening of the second day we arrived in toulon and as soon as we entered the gates we were delivered into the custody of an officer with a very sinister cast of countenance who after some conversation with the cuirassiers told us in a surly tone that our parole was at an end and gave us in charge of a corporal's guard with directions to conduct us to the prison near the arsenal we presented the cuirassiers with four dollars each for their civility and were then hurried away to our place of captivity i observed to o'brien that i was afraid that we must now bid farewell to anything like pleasure you're right there pater replied he but there's a certain jewel called hope that somebody found at the bottom of his chest when it was clean empty and so we must not lose sight of it but try and escape as soon as we can but the less we talk about it the better in a few minutes we arrived at our destination the door was opened ourselves and our bundles for we had only selected a few things for our march the colonel promising to forward the remainder as soon as we wrote to inform him to which depot we were consigned were rudely shoved in and as the doors again closed the heavy bolts were shot i felt a creeping chill sensation pass through my whole body as soon as we could see for although the prison was not very dark yet so suddenly thrown in after the glare of a bright sunshiny day at first we could distinguish nothing we found ourselves in company with about thirty english sailors one man who was playing at cards looked up for a moment as we came in and cried out hurrah my lads the more the merrier as if he really were pleased to find that there were others who were as unfortunate as himself we stood looking at the groups for about ten minutes when o'brien observed that we might as well come to an anchor foul ground being better than no bottom so we sat down in a corner upon our bundles where we remained for more than an hour surveying the scene without speaking a word to each other i could not speak i felt so very miserable we had been in the prison for about two hours when a lad in a very greasy ragged jacket with a pale emaciated face came up to us and said i perceive by your uniforms that you are both officers as well as myself o'brien stared at him for a little while and then answered upon my soul and honour then you have the advantage of us for it's more than i could perceive in you but i'll take your word for it pray what ship may have had the misfortune of losing such a credit to the service why i belong to the snapper cutter replied the young lad i was taken in a pre which the commanding officer had given in my charge to take to gibraltar but they won't believe that i'm an officer i have applied for officers allowance and rations and they won't give them to me well but they know that we are officers replied o'brien why do they shove us in here with the common seamen i suppose you are only put in here for the present replied the cutter's midshipman but why i cannot tell nor could we until afterwards when we found out as our narrative will show that the officer who received us from the cuirassiers had once quarrelled with colonel o'brien who first pulled his nose and afterwards ran him through the body being told by the cuirassiers that we were much esteemed by colonel o'brien he resolved to annoy us as much as he could and when he sent up the document announcing our arrival he left out the word officers and put us in confinement with the common seamen fortunately we were not destined to remain long in this detestable hole after a night of misery during which we remained sitting on our bundles and sleeping how we could leaning with our backs against the damp wall we were roused at daybreak by the unbarring of the prison doors followed up with an order to go into the prison yard we were huddled out like a flock of sheep by a file of soldiers with loaded muskets and as we went into the yard were ranged two and two the same officer who ordered us into prison commanded the detachment of soldiers who had us in charge o'brien stepped out of the ranks and addressing them stated that we are officers and had no right to be treated like common sailors the french officer replied that he had better information 
that we wore coats which did not belong to us upon which o'brien was in a great rage calling the officer a liar and demanded satisfaction for the insult appealing to the french soldiers and stating that colonel o'brien who was at set was his countryman and had received him for two months into his house upon parole which was quite sufficient to establish his being an officer the french soldiers appeared to side with o'brien after they had heard this explanation stating that no common english sailor could speak such good french and that they were present when we were sent in on parole and they asked the officer whether he intended to give satisfaction the officer stormed and drawing his sword out of the scabbard struck o'brien with the flat of the blade looking at him with contempt and ordering him into the ranks i could not help observing that during this scene the men of war sailors who were among the prisoners were very indignant while on the contrary those captured in merchant vessels appeared to be pleased with the insult offered to o'brien one of the french soldiers then made a sarcastic remark that the french officer did not much like the name of o'brien this so enraged the officer that he flew at o'brien pushed him back into the ranks and taking out a pistol threatened to shoot him through the head i must do the justice to the french soldiers that they all called out shame when o'brien returned to the ranks he looked defiance at the officer telling him that he would pocket the affront very carefully as he intended to bring it out again upon a future and more suitable occasion we were then marched out in ranks two and two being met in the street by two drummers and a crowd of people who had gathered to witness our departure the drums beat and away we went the officer who had charge of us mounted a small horse galloping up and down from one end of the ranks to the other with his sword drawn bullying swearing and striking with the flat of the blade at any one of the prisoners who was not in his proper place when we were close to the gates we were joined by another detachment of prisoners we were then ordered to halt and were informed through an interpreter that any one attempting to escape would immediately be shot after which information we once more proceeded on our route End of chapter 19chapter twenty of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter twenty o'brien fights a duel with a french officer and proves that the great art of fencing is knowing nothing about it we arrive at our new quarters which we find very secure at night we arrived at a small town the name of which i forget here we were all put into an old church for the night and a very bad night we passed we were afraid to lie down anywhere as like all ruined buildings in france the ground was covered with filth and the smell was shocking at daybreak the door of the church was again opened by the french soldiers and we were conducted to the square of the town where we found the troops quartered as the french officers walked along our ranks to look at us i perceived among them a captain whom we had known very intimately when we were living at set with colonel o'brien i cried out his name immediately he turned around and seeing o'brien and me he came up to us shaking us by the hand and expressing his surprise at finding us in such a situation o'brien explained to him how we had been treated at which he expressed his indignation as did the other officers who had collected round us the major who commanded the troops in the town turned to the french officer he was only a lieutenant who had conducted us from toulon and demanded of him his reason for behaving to us in such an unworthy manner he denied having treated us ill and said that he had been informed that we had put on officers dresses which did not belong to us at this o'brien declared that he was a liar and a cowardly foutre that he had struck him with the back of his sabre which he dared not have done if he had not been a prisoner adding that all he requested was satisfaction for the insult offered to him and appealed to the officers whether if it were refused the lieutenant's epaulets ought not to be cut off his shoulders the major commandant and the officers retired to consult and after a few minutes they agreed that the lieutenant was bound to give the satisfaction required the lieutenant replied that he was ready but at the same time did not appear to be very willing the prisoners were left in charge of the soldiers under a junior officer while the others accompanied by o'brien myself and the lieutenant walked to a short distance outside of town as we proceeded there i asked o'brien with what weapons they would fight i take it for granted replied he that it will be with the small sword but said i do you know anything about fencing devil a bit peter but that's all in my favour how can that be replied i 
i'll tell you peter if one man fences well and another is but an indifferent hand at it it is clear that the first will run the other through the body but if the other knows nothing at all about it why then peter the case is not quite so clear because the good fencer is almost as puzzled by your ignorance as you are by his skill and you become on more equal terms now peter i've made up my mind that i'll run that fellow through the body and so i will as sure as i am an o'brien well i hope you will but pray do not be too sure it's feeling sure that will make me able to do it peter by the blood of the o'briens didn't he slap me with a sword as if i were a clown in the pantomime peter i'll kill the harlequin scoundrel and my words as good as my bond by this time we had arrived at the ground the french lieutenant stripped to his shirt and trousers o'brien did the same kicking his boots off and standing upon the wet grass in his stockings the swords were measured and handed to them they took their distance and set to i must say that i was breathless with anxiety the idea of losing o'brien struck me with grief and terror i then felt the value of all his kindness to me and would have taken his place and have been run through the body rather than he should have been hurt at first o'brien put himself in the correct attitude of defence in imitation of the lieutenant but this was for a very few seconds he suddenly made a spring and rushed on his adversary stabbing at him with a velocity quite astonishing the lieutenant parrying in his defence until at last he had an opportunity of lounging at o'brien o'brien who no longer kept his left arm raised in equipoise caught the sword of the lieutenant at within six inches of the point and directing it under his left arm as he rushed in past his own through the lieutenant's body it was all over in less than a minute the lieutenant did not live half an hour afterwards the french officers were very much surprised at the result for they perceived at once that o'brien knew nothing of fencing o'brien gathered a tuft of grass wiped the sword which he presented to the officer to whom it belonged and thanking the major and the whole of them for their impartiality and gentlemanlike conduct led the way to the square where he again took his station in the ranks of the prisoners shortly after the major commandant came up to us and asked whether we would accept of our parole as in that case we might travel as we pleased we consented with many thanks for his civility and kindness but i could not help thinking at the time that the french officers were a little mortified at o'brien's success although they were too honourable to express the feeling i had almost forgot to say that on our return after the duel the cutter's midshipman called out to o'brien requesting him to state to the commandant that he was also an officer but o'brien replied that there was no evidence for it but his bare word if he were an officer he must prove it himself as everything in his appearance flatly contradicted his assertion it's very hard replied the midshipman and because my jacket's a little tarry or so i must lose my rank my dear fellow replied o'brien it's not because your jacket's a little tarry it is because what the frenchmen call your two ensemble it is quite disgraceful in an officer look at your face in the first puddle and you'll find that it would dirty the water you look into well it's very hard replied the midshipman but i must go on eating this black rye bread and very unkind of you it's very kind of me you spoil peen of the snapper prison will be a paradise to you when you get into good commons how you'll relish your grub by and by so now shut your pan or by the tail of jonah's whale i'll swear you're a spaniard i could not help thinking that o'brien was very severe upon the poor lad and i expostulated with him afterwards he replied peter if as a cutter's midshipman he is a bit of an officer the devil a bit is he of a gentleman either born or bred i'm not bound to bail every blackguard looking chap that i meet by the head of st peter i would blush to be seen in company if i were in the wildest bog in ireland with nothing but an old crow as spectator we were now again permitted to be on our parole and received every attention and kindness from the different officers who commanded the detachments which passed the prisoners from one town to the other in a few days we arrived at montpelier where we had orders to remain a short time until directions were received from government as to the depots for prisoners to which we were to be sent at this delightful town we had unlimited parole not even a gendarme accompanying us we lived at the table d'hote were permitted to walk about where we pleased and amused ourselves every evening at the theatre during our stay there we wrote to colonel o'brien at set thanking him for his kindness and narrating what had occurred since we parted i also wrote to celeste enclosing my letter unsealed in the one to colonel o'brien i told her the history of o'brien's duel 
and all I could think would interest her, how sorry I was to have parted from her, that I never would forget her, and trusted that some day, as she was only half a Frenchwoman, that we should meet again. Before we left Montpelier, we had the pleasure of receiving answers to our letters. The colonel's letters were very kind, particularly the one to me in which he called me his dear boy, and hoped that I should soon rejoin my friends, or prove an ornament to my country. In his letter to O'Brien, he requested him not to run me into useless danger, to recollect that I was not so well able to undergo extreme hardship. The answer, from Celeste, was written in English, but she must have had assistance from her father, or she could not have succeeded so well. It was like herself, very kind and affectionate, also ended with wishing me a speedy return to my friends, who must, she said, be so fond of me, that she despaired of ever seeing me more, but that she consoled herself as well as she could with the assurance that I should be happy. I forgot to say that Colonel O'Brien, in his letter to me, stated that he expected immediate orders to leave Set and take the command of some military post in the interior, or join the army, but which he could not tell, that they had packed up everything, and he was afraid that our correspondence must cease, as he could not state to what place we should direct our letters. I must here acquaint the reader with a circumstance which I forgot to mention, which was, that when Captain Savage sent in a flag of truce with our clothes and money, I thought that it was but justice to O'Brien that they should know on board of the frigate the gallant manner in which he had behaved. I knew that he never would tell himself. So, ill as I was at the time, I sent for Colonel O'Brien, and requested him to write down my statement of the affair, in which I mentioned how O'Brien had spiked the last gun, and had been taken prisoner by so doing, together with his attempting to save me. When the colonel had written all down, I requested that he would send for the major who first entered the fort with the troops, and translate it to him in French. This he did in my presence, and the major declared every word to be true. "'Will he attest it, colonel, as it may be of great service to O'Brien?' The major immediately assented. Colonel O'Brien then enclosed my letter with a short note from himself to Captain Savage. In ten days we received an order to march on the following morning. The sailors, among whom was our poor friend the midshipman of the Snapper Cutter, were ordered to Verdun. O'Brien and I, with eight masters of merchant vessels, who joined us at Montpelier, were directed by the government to be sent to Givet, a fortified town in the department of Ardennes. But at the same time orders arrived from government to treat the prisoners with great strictness, and not to allow any parole. It was exactly four months from the time of our capture that we arrived at our destined prison at Givet. Pater, said O'Brien, as he looked hastily at the fortifications and the river which divided the two towns, I say no reason, either English or French, that we should not eat our Christmas dinner in England. I have a bird's eye view of the outside, and now have only to find out whereabouts we may be in the inside. I must say that when I looked at the ditches and high ramparts, I had a different opinion. So had a gendarme who was walking by our side, and who had observed O'Brien's scrutiny, and who quietly said to him in French, Vous le croyez possible? Everything is possible to a brave man. The French armies have proved that, answered O'Brien. You are right, replied the gendarme, pleased with the compliment to his nation. I wish you success. You will deserve it, but, and he shook his head. If I could obtain a plan of the fortress, said O'Brien, I would give five Napoleons for one and he looked at the gendarme. I cannot see any objection to an officer, although a prisoner, studying fortification, replied the gendarme. In two hours you will be within the walls, and now I recollect in the map of the two towns the fortress is laid down sufficiently accurately to give you an idea of it. But we have conversed too long, so saying the gendarme dropped into the rear. In a quarter of an hour we arrived at the Place d'Armes, where we were met, as usual, by another detachment of troops and drummers, who paraded us through the town previous to our being drawn up before the governor's house. As we stopped at the governor's house, the gendarme who had left us in the square made a sign to O'Brien, as much as to say, I have it. O'Brien took out five Napoleons, which he wrapped in paper and held in his hand. In a minute or two, the gendarme came up and presented O'Brien with an old silk handkerchief, saying, Votre mouchoir, monsieur. Merci, replied O'Brien, putting the handkerchief which contained the map, into his pocket. Voici à boire, mon ami. And he slipped the paper with the five Napoleons into the hand of the gendarme, who immediately retreated. This was very fortunate for us, as we afterwards discovered that a mark had been put against O'Brien's and my name not to allow parole or permission to leave the fortress, even under surveillance. End of chapter 20
Chapter twenty one of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter twenty one. O'Brien receives his commission as lieutenant, and then we take French leave of Givet. If I doubted the practicability of escape when I examined the exterior, when we were ushered into the interior of the fortress, I felt that it was impossible, and I stated my opinion to O'Brien. We were conducted into a yard surrounded by a high wall. The buildings appropriated for the prisoners were built with lean-to roofs on one side, and at each side of the square was a sentry looking down upon us. It was very much like the dens which they now build for bears, only so much larger. O'Brien answered me with a pish, pater. It's the very security of the place which will enable us to get out of it. But don't talk, as there are always spies about who understand English. We were shown into a room allotted to six of us. Our baggage was examined and then delivered over to us. Better and better, pater, observed O'Brien they've not found it out what i inquired i oh only a little selection of articles which might be useful to us by and by he then showed me what i never before was aware of that he had a false bottom to his trunk but it was papered over like the rest and very ingeniously concealed and what is there o'brien inquired i never mind i had them made at montpelier you'll see by and by the others, who were lodged in the same room, then came in, and, after staying a quarter of an hour, went away at the sound of the dinner-bell. "'Now, Peter,' said O'Brien, "'I must get rid of my load. Turn the key.' O'Brien then undressed himself, and then he threw off his shirt and drawers, showed me a rope of silk with a knot at every two feet, about half an inch in size, wound round and round his body. There were about sixty feet of it altogether.' as i unwound it he turning round and round observed pater i've worn this rope ever since i left montpelier and you've no idea of the pain i have suffered but we must go to england and that's decided upon for some days o'brien who really was not very well kept to his room during this time he often examined the map given him by the gendarme one day he said to me pater can you swim no replied i but never mind that but i must mind it peter for observe we shall have to cross the river moose and the boats are not always to be had you observe that this fortress is washed by the river on one side and as it is the strongest side it is the least guarded we must escape by it are you then determined to escape o'brien i cannot perceive how we are even to get up this wall with four sentries staring us in the face never do you mind that pater mind your own business and first tell me do you intend to try your luck with me yes replied i most certainly if you have sufficient confidence in me to take me as your companion to tell you the truth pater i would not give a farthing to escape without you the prison was by all accounts very different from verdun and some others we had no parole but a little communication with the townspeople some were permitted to come in and supply us with various articles but their baskets were searched to see that they contained nothing that might lead to an escape on the part of the prisoners without the precautions that o'brien had taken any attempt would have been useless now pater said he one day i want nothing more than an umbrella for you why an umbrella for me to keep you from being drowned with too much water that's all rain won't drown me no no pater but buy a new one as soon as you can i did so o'brien boiled up a quantity of beeswax and oil and gave it several coats of this preparation he then put it carefully away in the ticking of his bed we had been now about two months in Givet when a steel's list was sent to a lieutenant who was confined there. The lieutenant came up to O'Brien and asked him his Christian name. Terence, to be sure, replied O'Brien. Then, answered the lieutenant, I may congratulate you on your promotion, for here you are upon the list of August. Sure, there must be some trifling mistake. Let me look at it. Terence O'Brien, sure enough. But now the question is, has any other fellow robbed me of my name in promotion at the same time? Father, what can it mean? I won't believe it, not a word of it. I've no more interest than a dog who drags cat's meat. I then told O'Brien how I had written to Captain Savage and had had the fact attested by the major who had made us prisoners. Well, Peter, said O'Brien, after a pause, there is a fable about a lion and a mouse. If by your means I have obtained my promotion, why, then the mouse is a finer beast than the lion. For a few days after this, O'Brien was very uneasy. 
but fortunately letters arrived by that time one to me from my father in which he requested me to draw for whatever money i might require saying that the whole family would retrench in every way to give me all the comfort which might be obtained in my unfortunate situation i wept at this kindness and more than ever longed to throw myself in his arms and thank him he also told me that my uncle william was dead and that there was only one between him and the title but that my grandfather was in good health and had been very kind to him lately my mother was much afflicted at my having been made a prisoner and requested i would write as often as i could o'brien's letter was from captain savage the frigate had been sent home with despatches and o'brien's conduct represented to the admiralty which had in consequence promoted him to the rank of lieutenant o'brien came to me with the letter his countenance radiant with joy as he put it into my hands in return i put mine into his and he read it over peter my boy i'm under great obligations to you when you were wounded and feverish you thought of me at a time when you had quite enough to think of yourself but i never think in words i see your uncle william is dead how many more uncles have you my uncle john who is married has already two daughters blessings on him may he stick to the female line of business peter my boy you shall be a lord before you die nonsense o'brien i have no chance don't put such foolish ideas in my head what chance had i of being a lieutenant and am i not one but peter do me one favour as i am really a lieutenant just touch your hat to me only once that's all but i wish the compliment just to see how it looks lieutenant o'brien said i touching my hat have you any further orders yea sir replied he that you never presume to touch your hat to me again unless we sail together and then that's a different sort of thing about a week afterwards o'brien came to me and said the new moon's quartered in with foul weather if it holds prepare for a start i have put what is necessary in your little haversack it may be to-night go to bed now and sleep for a week if you can but you'll get but little sleep if we succeed for the week to come this was about eight o'clock i went to bed and about twelve i was roused by o'brien who told me to dress myself carefully and come down to him in the yard it was some time before i could find o'brien who was hard at work and as i had already been made acquainted with all his plans i will now explain them at montpelier he had procured six large pieces of iron about eighteen inches long with a gimlet at one end of each and a square at the other which fitted to a handle which unshipped for precaution he had a spare handle but each handle fitted to all the irons o'brien had screwed one of these pieces of iron between the interstices of the stones of which the wall was built and sitting astride on that was fixing another about three feet above when he had accomplished this he stood upon the lower iron and supporting himself by the second which about met his hip he screwed in a third always fixing them about six inches on one side of the other and not one above the other when he had screwed in his six irons he was about half up the wall and then he fastened his rope which he had carried round his neck to the upper iron and lowering himself down unscrewed the four lower irons then ascending by the rope he stood upon the fifth iron and supporting himself by the upper iron recommenced his task by these means he arrived in the course of an hour and a half at the top of the wall where he fixed his last iron and making his rope fast he came down again now peter said he there's no fear of the sentries seeing us if they had the eyes of cats they could not until we were on the top of the wall but then we arrive at the laces and we must creep to the ramparts on our bellies i am going up with all the materials give me your haversack you will go up lighter and recollect should any accident happen to me you run to bed again if on the contrary i pull the rope up and down three or four times you may sheer up it as fast as you can o'brien then loaded himself with the other rope the two knapsacks iron crows and other implements he had procured and last of all with the umbrella pater if the rope bears me with all this it is clear it will bear such a creature as you are therefore don't be afraid so whispering he commenced his ascent in about three minutes he was up and the rope pulled i immediately followed him and found the rope very easy to climb from the knots at every two feet which gave me a hold for my feet and i was up in as short a time as he was he caught me by the collar putting his wet hand on my mouth i lay down beside him while he pulled up the rope we then crawled on our stomachs across the glacis till we arrived at the rampart it was some time before o'brien could find out the point exactly above the drawbridge of the first ditch at last he did he fixed his crowbar in and lowered down the rope now pater 
I had better go first again. When I shake the rope from below, all's right. O'Brien descended, and in a few minutes the rope again shook. I followed him and found myself received in his arms upon the meeting of the drawbridge. But the drawbridge itself was up. O'Brien led the way across the chains, and I followed him. When we crossed the moat, we found a barrier gate locked. This puzzled us. O'Brien pulled out his picklocks to pick it, but without success. Here we were fast. We must undermine the gate, O'Brien. We must pull up the pavement until we can creep under. Peter, you are a fine fellow. I never thought of that. We worked very hard until the hole was large enough, using the crowbar, which was left, and a little wrench, which O'Brien had with him. By these means we got under the gate in the course of an hour or more. This gate led to the lower rampart, but we had a covered way to pass through before we arrived at it. We proceeded very cautiously when we heard a noise. We stopped, and found it was a sentry, who was fast asleep, snoring. O'Brien thought for a moment. Peter, said he, now is the time for you to prove yourself a man. He is fast asleep, but his noise must be stopped. I will stop his mouth but at the very moment that I do so, you must throw open the pan of his musket, and then he cannot fire it. I will, O'Brien. Don't fear me. We crept cautiously up to him, and O'Brien motioned to me to put my thumb upon the pan. I did so, and the moment that O'Brien put his hand upon the soldier's mouth, I threw open the pan. The fellow struggled and snapped his lock as a signal, but of course without discharging his musket, and in a minute he was not only gagged but bound by O'Brien with my assistance. Leaving him there, we proceeded to the rampart, and fixing the crowbar again, O'Brien descended. I followed him and found him in the river, hanging on to the rope. The umbrella was open and turned upwards. The preparation made it resist the water, and, as previously explained to me by O'Brien, I had only to hold on at arm's length to two beckets, which he had fixed to the point of the umbrella which was under the water. To the same part O'Brien had a tow-line, which, taking in his teeth, he towed me down the stream to about a hundred yards clear of the fortress where we landed. O'Brien was so exhausted that for a few minutes he remained quite motionless. I also was benumbed with the cold. Peter, said he, thank God we have succeeded so far. Now we must push on as far as we can, for we shall have daylight in two hours. O'Brien took out his flask of spirits, and we both drank a half-tumbler, at least, but we should not, in our state, have been affected with a bottle." We now walked along the riverside till we fell in with a small craft, with a boat towing astern. O'Brien swam to it, and cutting the painter without getting in, towed it on shore. The oars were fortunately in the boat. I got in and we shoved off, and rowed away down the stream till the dawn of day. All's right, Peter. Now we land. This is the forest of our dens. We landed, replaced the oars in the boat, and pushed her off into the stream, to induce people to suppose that she had broken adrift and then hastened into the thickest of the wood. It rained hard. I shivered and my teeth chattered with the cold, but there was no help for it. We again took a dram of spirits, and worn out with fatigue and excitement, soon fell fast asleep upon a bed of leaves which we had collected together. End of chapter 21《Chapter 22 of Peter Simple This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 22. Grave Consequences of Gravitation. O'Brien enlists himself as a gendarme and takes charge of me. We are discovered and obliged to run for it. The Pleasures of a Winter Bivouac. It was not until noon that I awoke, when I found that O'Brien had covered me more than a foot deep with leaves to protect me from the weather. I felt quite warm and comfortable. My clothes had dried on me, but without giving me cold. "'How very kind of you, O'Brien,' said I. "'Not a bit, Peter. You have hard work to go through yet, and I must take care of you. You're but a bud, and I'm a full-blown rose.' So saying, he put the spirit flask to his mouth and then handed it to me. "'Now, Peter,' we must make a start for depend upon it they will scour the country for us but this is a large wood and they may as well attempt to find a needle in a bundle of hay if we once get into the heart of it we set off forcing our way through the thicket for about three hours o'brien looking occasionally at his pocket compass 
it then was again nearly dark and o'brien proposed a halt we made up a bed of leaves for the night and slept much more comfortably than we had the night before all our bread was wet but as we had no water it was rather a relief the meat we had with us was sufficient for a week once more we laid down and fell fast asleep about five o'clock in the morning i was roused by o'brien who at the same time put his hand gently over my mouth i sat up and perceived a large fire not far from us the philistines are upon us pater said he i have reconnoitred and they are the gendarmes i am fearful of going away as we may stumble upon some more of them i have been thinking what's best before i waked you and it appears to me that we had better get up the tree and lie there at that time we were hidden in a copse of underwood with a large oak in the centre covered with ivy i think so too o'brien shall we go up now or wait a little now to be sure that they're eating their prog mount you peter and i'll help you o'brien shoved me up the tree and then waiting a little while to bury our haversacks among the leaves he followed me he desired me to remain in a very snug position on the first fork of the tree while he took another amongst a bunch of ivy on the largest bough there we remained for about an hour when day dawned we observed the gendarmes mustered at the break of day by the corporal and then they all separated in different directions to scour the wood we were delighted to perceive this as we hoped soon to be able to get away but there was one gendarme who remained he walked round the tree looking up into every part but we were well concealed and he did not discover us for some time at last he saw me and ordered me to come down i paid no attention to him as i had no signal from o'brien he walked round a little farther until he was directly under the branch on which o'brien lay taking up this position he had a fairer aim at me and levelled his musket saying descendez ou je tire still i continued immovable for i knew not what to do i shut my eyes however the musket shortly afterwards was discharged and whether from fear or not i can hardly tell i lost my hold of a sudden and down i came i was stunned with the fall and thought that i must have been wounded and was very much surprised when instead of the gendarme o'brien came up to me and asked whether i was hurt i answered i believed not and got up on my legs when i found the gendarme lying on the ground breathing heavily but insensible when o'brien perceived the gendarme level his musket at me he immediately dropped from the bow right upon his head this occasioned the musket to go off without hitting me and at the same time the weight of o'brien's body from such a height killed the gendarme for he expired before we left him now pater said o'brien this is the most fortunate thing in the world and will take us half through the country but we have no time to lose he then stripped the gendarme who still breathed heavily and dragging him to our bed of leaves covered him up threw off his clothes which he tied up in a bundle and gave to me to carry and put on those of the gendarme i could not help laughing at the metamorphosis and asked o'brien what he intended sure i'm a gendarme bringing with me a prisoner who has escaped when we stopped at night my youth excited a great deal of commiseration especially from the females and in one instance i was offered assistance to escape i consented to it but at the same time informed o'brien of the plan proposed o'brien kept watch i dressed myself and was at the open window when he rushed in seizing me declaring that he would inform the government of the conduct of the parties their confusion and distress was very great they offered o'brien twenty thirty forty napoleons if he would hush it up for they were aware of the penalty and imprisonment o'brien replied that he would not accept any money in compromise of his duty and that after he had given me into the charge of the gendarme of the next post his business was at an end and he must return to flushing where he was stationed i have his sister there replied the hostess who keeps an inn you'll want good quarters and a friendly cup do not denounce us and i'll give you a letter to her which if it does not prove of service you can then return and give the information o'brien consented the letter was delivered and read to him in which the sister was requested by the love she bore to the writer to do all she could for the bearer who had the power of making the whole family miserable but had refused so to do o'brien pocketed the letter filled his brandy flask and saluting all the women left the cabaret dragging me after him with a cord we were following our route avoiding malines which was a fortified town and at the time were in a narrow lane with wide ditches full of water on each side 
at the turning of a sharp corner we met the gendarme who had supplied o'brien with a map of the town of Givet. good morning comrade said he to o'brien looking earnestly at him whom have we here a young englishman whom i picked up close by escaped from prison where from he will not say but i suspect from Givet. there are two who have escaped from Givet, replied he how they escaped no one can imagine but continued he again looking at o'brien avec les brave il n'y a rien d'impossible that is true replied o'brien i have taken one the other cannot be far off you had better look for him i should like to find him replied the gendarme for you know that to retake a runaway prisoner is certain promotion you will be made a corporal so much the better replied o'brien adieu mon ami nay i merely come for a walk and will return with you to malines where of course you are bound we shall not get there to-night said o'brien my prisoner is too much fatigued well then we go as far as we can and i will assist you perhaps we may find the second who i understand obtained a map of the fortress by some means or another o'brien observed that the english prisoners were very liberal that he knew that a hundred napoleons were often paid for assistance and he thought that no corporal's rank was equal to a sum that would in france make a man happy and independent for life very true replied the gendarme and let me only look upon that sum and i will guarantee a positive safety out of france then we understand each other replied o'brien this boy will give two hundred one half shall be yours if you will assist i will think of it replied the gendarme who then talked about indifferent subjects until we arrived at a small town called a carshot when we proceeded to a cabaret the usual curiosity passed over we were left alone o'brien telling the gendarme that he would expect his reply that night or to-morrow morning the gendarme said to-morrow morning o'brien requesting him to take charge of me he called the woman of the cabaret to show him a room she showed him one or two which he refused as not sufficiently safe for a prisoner the woman laughed at the idea observing what had he to fear from a pauvre enfant like me yet this poor enfant escaped from Givet, replied o'brien these englishmen are devils from their birth the last room showed to o'brien suited him and he chose it the woman not presuming to contradict a gendarme as soon as they came down again o'brien ordered me to bed and went upstairs with me he bolted the door and pulling me to the large chimney we put our heads up and whispered that our conversation could not be heard this man is not to be trusted said o'brien and we must give him the slip i know my way out of the inn and we must return the way we came and then strike off in another direction but will he permit us not if he can help it but i soon shall find out his manoeuvres o'brien then went and stopped the keyhole by hanging his handkerchief across it and stripping himself of his gendarme uniform put on his own clothes then stuffed the blankets and pillows into the gendarme's dress and laid it down on the outside of the bed as if it were a man sleeping in his clothes indeed it was an admirable deception he laid his musket by the side of the image and then did the same to my bed making it appear as if there was a person asleep in it of my size and putting my cap on the pillow now pater we'll see if he is watching us he will wait till he thinks we are asleep the light still remained in the room and about an hour afterwards we heard a noise of one treading on the stairs upon which as agreed we crept under the bed the latch of our door was tried and finding it open which he did not expect the gendarme entered and looking at both beds went away now said i after the gendarme had gone downstairs o'brien ought we not to escape i have been thinking of it peter and i have come to a resolution that we can manage it better he is certain to come again in an hour or two it is only eleven now i'll play him a trick o'brien then took one of the blankets made it fast to the window which he left wide open and at the same time disarranged the images he had made up so as to let the gendarme perceive that they were counterfeit we again crept under the bed and as o'brien foretold in about an hour more the gendarme returned our lamp was still burning but he had a light of his own he looked at the beds perceived at once that he had been duped went to the open window and then exclaimed sacre dieu il mon échappe et je ne suis plus corpore foutre à la chasse he rushed out of the room and in a few minutes afterwards we heard him open the street door and go away that will do peter said o'brien laughing now we'll be off also although there's no great hurry o'brien then resumed his dress of the gendarme 
and about an hour afterwards we went down and wishing the hostess all happiness quitted the cabaret returning the same road by which we had come now peter said o'brien we're in a bit of a puzzle this dress won't do any more still there's a respectability about it which will not allow me to put it off till the last moment we walked on till daylight when we hid ourselves in a copse of trees our money was not exhausted as i had drawn upon my father for sixty pounds which with the disadvantageous exchange had given me fifty napoleons on the fifth day being then six days from the forest of our dens we hid ourselves in a small wood about a quarter of a mile from the road i remained there while o'brien as a gendarme went to obtain provisions as usual i looked out for the best shelter during his absence and what was my horror at falling in with a man and a woman who lay dead in the snow having evidently perished from the inclemency of the weather just as i discovered them o'brien returned and i told him he went with me to view the bodies they were dressed in a strange attire ribbons pinned upon their clothes and two pairs of very high stilts lying by their sides o'brien surveyed them and then said peter this is the very best thing that could have happened to us we may now walk through france without soiling our feet with a cursed country how do you mean i mean said he that these are the people that we met near montpelier who came from the lands walking about on their stilts for the amusement of others to obtain money in their own country they are obliged to walk so now peter it appears to me that the man's clothes will fit me and the girls poor creature how pretty she looks cold in death will fit you all we have to do is practice a little and then away we start o'brien then with some difficulty pulled off the man's jacket and trousers and having so done buried him in the snow the poor girl was despoiled of her gown and upper petticoat with every decency and also buried we collected the clothes and stilts and removed to another quarter where we pitched upon a hovel and took our meal peter said o'brien lie down and sleep and i'll keep the watch not a word i will have it down at once i did so and in a very few minutes was fast asleep for i was worn out with cold and fatigue just as the day broke o'brien roused me he had stood sentry all night and looked very haggard o'brien you are ill said i not a bit but i've emptied the brandy flask and that's a bad job however it is to be remedied i did not go to sleep again for some time i was so anxious to see o'brien fast asleep he went in and out several times during which i pretended to be fast asleep at last it rained in torrents and then he laid down and in a few minutes overpowered by nature he fell fast asleep snoring so loudly that i was afraid some one would hear us i then got up and watched occasionally lying down and slumbering a while and then going down to the door End of chapter 22。二十四節目の最後になります。今日の配信は、ありがとうございました。また次回お会いしましょう。exalted with our success we march through france without touching the ground i become feminine we are voluntary conscripts at daybreak i called o'brien who jumped up in a great hurry sure i've been asleep peter yes you have replied i and i thank heaven that you have for no one could stand such fatigue as you have much longer and if you fall ill what will become of me this was touching him on the right point well peter since there's no harm come of it there's no harm done i've had sleep enough for the next week that's certain we returned to the wood the snow had disappeared and the rain ceased the sun shone out from between the clouds and we felt warm don't pass so near that way said o'brien we shall see the poor creatures now that the sun is gone peter we must shift our quarters to-night for i have been to every cabaret in the village and i cannot go there any more without suspicion although i am a gendarme we remained there till the evening and then set off still returning toward givet about an hour before daylight we arrived at a copse of trees close to the roadside and surrounded by a ditch not above a quarter of a mile from a village it appears to me said o'brien that this will do i will now put you there and then go boldly to the village and see what i can get for here we must stay at least a week we walked to the copse and the ditch being rather too wide for me to leap o'brien laid the four stilts together so as to form a bridge over which i contrived to walk 
tossing to me all the bundles and desiring me to leave the stilts as a bridge for him on his return he set off to the village with his musket on his shoulder he was away two hours when he returned with a large supply of provisions the best we had ever thar said he we have enough for a good week and look here peter this is better than all and he showed me two large horse rugs excellent replied i now we shall be comfortable i paid honestly for all these but the rugs observed o'brien i was afraid to buy them so i stole em however we'll leave em here for those they belong to it's only borrowing after all we now prepared a very comfortable shelter with branches which we wove together and laying the leaves in the sun to dry soon obtained a soft bed to put our horse rug on while we covered ourselves up with the other our bridge of stilts we had removed so that we felt ourselves quite secure from surprise at dark to bed we went and slept soundly i never felt more refreshed during our wanderings at daylight o'brien got up now peter a little practice before breakfast what practice do you mean mean why on the stilts i expect in a week that you'll be able to dance a gavotte at least for mind me peter you travel out of france upon these stilts depend upon it o'brien then took the stilts belonging to the man giving me those of the woman we strapped them to our thighs and by fixing our backs to a tree contrived to get upright on them but at the first attempt to walk o'brien fell to the right and i fell to the left o'brien fell against a tree but i fell on my nose and made it bleed very much however we laughed and got up again and although we had several falls at least we made a better hand of them o'brien then dressed me in the poor girl's clothes and himself in the man's they fitted very well peter you make a very pretty girl said o'brien but o'brien replied i as these petticoats are not very warm i i mean to cut off my trousers up to my knees and wear them underneath that's all right said o'brien the next morning we made use of our stilts to cross the ditch and carrying them in our hands we boldly set off on the high road to malines we met several people gendarmes and others but with the exception of some remarks upon my good looks we passed unnoticed towards the evening we arrived at the village where we had slept in the outhouse and as soon as we entered it we put on our stilts and commenced a march when the crowd had gathered we held out our caps and receiving nine or ten sous we entered a cabaret many questions were asked us as to where we came from and o'brien answered telling lies innumerable i played the modest girl and o'brien who stated i was his sister appeared very careful and jealous of my attention we slept well and the next morning continued our route to malines as we entered the barriers we put on our stilts and marched boldly on the guard at the gate stopped us not from suspicion but to amuse themselves and i was forced to submit to several kisses from their garlic lips before we were allowed to enter the town we again mounted on our stilts for the guard had forced us to dismount or they could not have kissed me every now and then imitating a dance until we arrived at the grande place where we stopped opposite the hotel and commenced a sort of waltz which we had practised the people in the hotel looked out of the window to see our exhibition and when we had finished i went up to the windows with o'brien's cap to collect the money what was my surprise to perceive colonel o'brien looking full in my face and staring very hard at me what was my greater astonishment at seeing celeste who immediately recognized me and ran back to the sofa in the room putting her hands up to her eyes and crying out c'est lui c'est lui fortunately o'brien was close to me or i should have fallen but he supported me peter ask the crowd for money or you are lost i did so and collecting some pence then asked him what i should do go back to the window you can then judge of what will happen i returned to the window colonel o'brien had disappeared but celeste was there as if waiting for me i held out the cap to her and she thrust her hand into it the cap sunk with the weight i took out a purse which i kept closed in my hand and put it into my bosom celeste then retired from the window and when she had gone to the back of the room kissed her hand to me and went out the door i remained stupefied for a moment but o'brien roused me and we quitted the grand place taking up our quarters at a low cabaret on examining the purse i found fifty napoleons in it they must have been obtained from her father at the cabaret where we stopped we were informed that the officer who was at the hotel had been appointed to the command of the strong fort of bergen op zoom and was proceeding thither we walked out of the town early in the morning after o'brien had made purchases of some of the clothes usually worn by the peasantry when within a few miles of st nicholas 
we threw away our stilts and the clothes which we had on and dressed ourselves in those o'brien had purchased o'brien had not forgot to provide us with two large brown-coloured blankets which we strapped on to our shoulders as the soldiers do their coats it was bitter cold weather and the snow had fallen heavily during the whole day but although nearly dusk there was a bright moon ready for us we walked very fast and soon observed persons ahead of us let us overtake them we may obtain some information as we came up with them one of them they were both lads of seventeen to eighteen said to o'brien i thought we were the last but i was mistaken how far is it to st nicholas how should i know replied o'brien i am a stranger in these parts as well as yourself from what part of france do you come demanded the other his teeth chattering with the cold for he was badly clothed and with little defence from the inclement weather from montpelier replied o'brien and i from toulouse a sad change comrades from olives and vines to such a climate as this curse the conscription i intended to have taken a little wife next year o'brien gave me a push as if to say here's something that will do and then continued and curse the conscription i say too for i had just married and now my wife is left to be annoyed by the attention of the fermier general but it can't be helped c'est pour la france c'est pour la croix we shall be too late to get a billet replied the other and not a sou have i in my pockets i doubt if i get up with the main body till they are at flushing by our route they are at axel to-day if we arrive at st nicholas we shall do well replied o'brien but i have a little money left and i'll not see a comrade want a supper or a bed who is going to serve his country you can repay me when we meet at flushing that i will with thanks replied the frenchman and so will jacques here if you will trust him with pleasure replied o'brien who then entered into long conversation by which he drew out from the frenchman that a party of conscripts had been ordered to flushing and that they had dropped behind the main body in about an hour we arrived at st nicholas and after some difficulty obtained entrance into a cabaret vive la france said o'brien going up to the fire and throwing the snow off his hat in a short time we were seated to a good supper and very tolerable wine the hostess sitting down by us and listening to the true narratives of the real conscripts and the false one of o'brien after supper the conscript who first addressed us pulled out his printed paper with the route laid down and observed that we were two days behind the others o'brien read it over and laid it on the table at the same time calling for more wine having already pushed it round very freely we did not drink much ourselves but plied them hard and at last the conscript commenced the whole history of his intended marriage and his disappointment tearing his hair and crying now and again never mind interrupted o'brien every two or three minutes bouvons un autre pour la gloire and thus he continued to make them both drink until they reeled away to bed forgetting their printed paper which o'brien had some time before slipped away from the table we also retired to our room when o'brien observed to me peter this description is as much like me as i am to old nick but that's of no consequence as nobody goes willingly as a conscript and therefore they will never have a doubt but that it is all right we must be off early to-morrow while these good people are in bed and steal a long march upon them i consider that we are now safe as far as flushing End of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Twenty Four. What occurred at Flushing, and what occurred when we got out of Flushing? An hour before daybreak, we started. The snow was thick on the ground, but the sky was clear and without any difficulty or interruption was passed through the towns of axel and haste arrived at turnus on the fourth day and we went over to flushing in company with about a dozen more stragglers from the main body as we landed the guard asked us whether we were conscripts o'brien replied that he was and held out his paper they took his name or rather that of the person it belonged to down in a book and told him that he must apply to the etat major before three o'clock we passed on delighted with our success and then o'brien pulled out the letter which had been given to him by the woman of the cabaret who had offered to assist me to escape when o'brien passed off as a gendarme and reading the address demanded his way to the street we soon found out the house and entered conscripts said the woman of the house looking at o'brien i am billeted full already 
it must be a mistake where's your order read said o'brien handing her the letter she read the letter and putting it into her neckerchief desired him to follow her o'brien beckoned me to come and we went into a small room what can i do for you said the woman i will do all in my power but alas you will march from here in two or three days never mind replied o'brien we will talk the matter over by and by but at present only oblige us by letting us remain in this little room we do not wish to be seen come in donc you a conscript and not wish to be seen are you then intending to desert answer me one question you have read that letter do you intend to act up to its purport as your sister requests as i hope for mercy i will if i suffer everything she is a dear sister and would not write so earnestly if she had not strong reasons my house and everything you command are yours can i say more what is your name inquired o'brien louise eustache you might have read it on the letter are you married oh yes these six years my husband is seldom at home he is a flushing pilot a hard life harder even than that of a soldier who is this lad he is my brother who if i go as a soldier intends to volunteer as a drummer pauvre enfant c'est dommage the cabaret was full of conscripts and other people so that the hostess had enough to do at night we were shown by her into a small bedroom adjoining the room we occupied you are quite alone here the conscripts are to muster to-morrow i find in the plastarn at two o'clock do you intend to go no replied o'brien they will think that i am behind it is of no consequence well replied the woman do as you please you may trust me but i am so busy without any one to assist me that until they leave the town i can hardly find time to speak to you that will be soon enough my good hostess replied o'brien au revoir the next evening the woman came in in some alarm stating that a conscript had arrived whose name had been given in before and the person who had given it in had not mustered at the place that the conscript had declared that his pass had been stolen from him by a person with whom he had stopped at st nicholas and that there were orders for a strict search to be made through the town as it was known that some english officers had escaped and it was supposed that one of them had obtained the pass surely you are not english inquired the woman looking earnestly at o'brien indeed but i am my dear replied o'brien and so is this lad with me and the favour which your sister requires is that you help us over the water for which service there are one hundred louis ready to be paid upon delivery of us oh mon dieu mais c'est impossible impossible replied o'brien was that the answer i gave your sister in her trouble oh mon c'est difficile that's quite another concern but with your husband a pilot i should think a great part of the difficulty removed my husband i've no power over him replied the woman putting her apron up to her eyes but one hundred louis may have replied o'brien there is truth in that observed the woman after a pause but what am i to do if they come to search the house send us out of it until you can find an opportunity to send us to england i'll leave it all to you your sister expects it from you and she shall not be disappointed if god helps us replied the woman after a short pause but i fear you must leave this house and the town also to-night how are we to leave the town i will arrange that be ready at four o'clock for the gates are shut at dusk i must go now for there is no time to be lost we are in a nice mess now o'brien observed i after the woman had quitted the room devil a bit peter i feel no anxiety whatever except at leaving such good quarters we packed up all our effects not forgetting our two blankets and waited the return of the hostess in about an hour she entered the room i have spoken to my husband's sister who lives about two miles on the road to middleburg she is in town for now for it is market day and you will be safe where she hides you i told her it was by my husband's request or she would not have consented here boy put on these clothes i will assist you once more i was dressed as a girl and when my clothes were on o'brien burst out into laughter at my blue stockings and short petticoats il n'est pas mal observed the hostess as she fixed a small cap on my head and then tied a kerchief under my chin which partly hid my face o'brien put on a great coat which the woman handed to him with a wide-brimmed hat now follow me she led us into the street which was thronged till we arrived at the market-place when she met another woman who joined her at the end of the market-place stood a small horse and a cart into which the strange woman and i mounted while o'brien by the directions of the landlady led the horse through the crowd until we arrived at the barriers when she wished us good day in a loud voice before the guard the guard took no notice of us 
and we passed safely through and found ourselves upon a neatly paved road as straight as an arrow and lined on each side with high trees and a ditch in about an hour we stopped near to a farmhouse of the woman who was in charge of us do you observe the wood she said to o'brien pointing to one about half a mile from the road i dare not take you into the house my husband is so violent against the english who captured his short and made him a poor man that he would inform against you immediately but go you there make yourselves as comfortable as you can to-night and to-morrow i will send you what you want adieu je vous plains pauvre enfant she said looking at me as she drove off in the cart towards her own house peter said o'brien i think that her kicking us out of her house is a proof of her sincerity and therefore i say no more about it we have the brandy flask to keep up our spirits now then for the wood though by the powers i shall have no relish for any of your picnic parties as they call them for the next twelve years but o'brien how can we get over this ditch in petticoats i could hardly leave it in my clothes you must tie your petticoats around your waist and make a good run get over as far as you can and i will drag you through the rest but you forget that we are to sleep in the wood and that's no laughing matter to get wet through freezing so hard as it does now very true pater but as the snow lies so deep upon the ditch perhaps the ice may bear i'll try if it bears me it will not condescend to bend at your shrimp of a carcass o'brien tried the ice which was firm and we both walked over and making all the haste we could arrived at the wood as the woman called it but which was not more than a clump of trees about half an acre we cleared away the snow for about six feet round a very hollow part and then o'brien cut stakes and fixed them in the earth to which we stretched one blanket the snow being about two feet deep there was plenty of room to creep underneath the blanket we then collected all the leaves we could beating the snow off of them and laid them at the bottom of the hole over the leaves we spread the other blanket taking our bundles in we then stopped up with snow every side of the upper blanket except the hole to creep in at it was quite astonishing what a warm place this became in a short time after we had remained in it it was almost too warm although the weather outside was piercingly cold after a good meal and a dose of brandy we both fell fast asleep but not until i had taken off my woman's attire and resumed my own clothes we never slept better or more warmly than we did in this hole which we had made on the ground covered with ice and snow End of chapter 24chapter twenty five of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter twenty five o'brien parts company to hunt for provisions and i have other company in consequence of another hunt o'brien pathetically mourns my death and finds me alive we escape the ensuing morning we looked out anxiously for the promised assistance for we were not very rich in provisions although what we had were of a very good quality it was not until three o'clock in the afternoon that we perceived a little girl coming towards us escorted by a large mastiff when she arrived at the copse of trees where we lay concealed she cried out to the dog in dutch who immediately scoured the wood until he came to our hiding-place when he crouched down at the entrance barking furiously and putting us in no small dread lest he should attack us but the little girl spoke to him again and he remained in the same position looking at us wagging his tail with his under jaw lying on the snow she soon came up and looking underneath put a basket in and nodded her head we emptied the basket o'brien took out a napoleon and offered it to her she refused it but o'brien forced it into her hand upon which she again spoke to the dog who commenced barking so furiously at us that we expected every moment he would fly upon us the girl at the same time presenting the napoleon and pointing to the dog i went forward and took the napoleon from her at which she immediately silenced the enormous brute and laughing at us hastened away boy the powers that's a fine little girl said o'brien i'll back her and her dog against any man well i never had a dog set at me for giving money before but we live and learn paid her and now let's see what she's brought in the basket we found half-boiled eggs bread and a smoked mutton ham with a large bottle of gin what a nice little girl i hope she will often favour us with her company i've been thinking, it better that we're quite as well off here as in a midshipman's berth 
you forget that you are a lieutenant well so i did peter and that's the truth but it's the force of habit now let's make our dinner it's a new-fashioned way though of making a meal lying down but however it's economical for it must take longer to swallow the victuals the romans used to eat their meals lying down so i have read o'brien i can't say that i ever heard it mentioned in ireland but that don't prove that it was not the case so peter i take your word for it murder how fast it snows again i wonder what my father's thinking on just at this moment this observation of o'brien induced us to talk about our friends and relations in england and after much conversation we fell fast asleep the next morning we found the snow had fallen about eight inches and weighing down our upper blanket so much that we were obliged to go out and cut stakes to support it from the inside while we were thus employed we heard a loud noise and shouting and perceived several men apparently armed and accompanied with dogs running straight in the direction of the wood where we were encamped we were much alarmed thinking that they were in search of us but on a sudden they turned off in another direction continuing with the same speed as before what could it be said i to o'brien i can't exactly say peter but i should think that they were hunting something and the only game that i think likely to be in such a place as this are otters i was of the same opinion we expected the little girl but she didn't come and after looking out for her till dark we crawled into our hole and supped upon the remainder of our provisions the next day as may be supposed we were very anxious for her arrival but she did not appear at the time expected night again came on and we went to bed without having any sustenance except a small piece of bread that was left and some gin which was remaining in the flask peter said o'brien if she don't come again to-morrow i'll try what i can do for i've no idea of our dying of hunger here like the two babes in the wood and being found covered up with dead leaves if she does not appear at three o'clock i'm off for provisions and i don't see much danger for in this dress i look as much of a boor as any man in holland we passed an uneasy night as we felt convinced that either the danger was so great that they dare not venture to assist us or that being overruled they had betrayed us and left us to manage how we could the next morning i climbed up the only large tree in the copse and looked round especially in the direction of the farmhouse belonging to the woman who had pointed out to us our place of concealment but nothing was to be seen but one vast tract of flat country covered with snow and now and then a vehicle passing at a distance on the middleburg road i descended and found o'brien preparing for a start he was very melancholy and said to me peter if i am taken you must at all risks put on your girl's clothes and go to flushing to the cabaret the women there i am sure will protect you and send you back to england i only want two napoleons take all the rest you will require them if i am not back by to-night set off for flushing to-morrow morning o'brien waited some time longer talking with me and then it being past four o'clock he shook me by the hand and without speaking left the wood i never felt miserable during the whole time since we were first put into prison at toulon till that moment and when he was a hundred yards off i knelt down and prayed he had been absent two hours and it was quite dusk when i heard a noise at a distance it advanced every moment nearer and nearer on a sudden i heard a rustling of the bushes and hastened under the blanket which was covered with snow in hopes that they might not perceive the entrance but i was hardly there before in dashed after me an enormous wolf i cried out expecting to be torn to pieces every moment but the creature lay on his belly his mouth wide open his eyes glaring and his long tongue hanging out of his mouth and although he touched me he was so exhausted that he did not attack me the noise increased and i immediately perceived that it was the hunters in pursuit of him i had crawled in feet first the wolf ran in head foremost so that we lay head and tail i crept out as fast as i could and perceived men and dogs not two hundred yards off in full chase i hastened to the large tree and had not ascended six feet when they came up the dogs flew to the hole and in a very short time the wolf was killed the hunters being too busy to observe me i had in the meantime climbed up the trunk of the tree and hid myself as well as i could being not fifteen yards from them i heard their expressions of surprise as they lifted up the blanket and dragged out the dead wolf which they carried away with them their conversation being in dutch i could not understand it but i was certain that they made use of the word english the hunters and dogs quitted the copse and i was about to descend when one of them returned and pulling up the blankets rolled them together and walked away with them fortunately he did not perceive our bundles by the little light given by the moon i waited a short time and then came down what to do i knew not 
if i did not remain and o'brien returned what would he think if i did i should be dead with cold before the morning i looked for our bundles and found that in the conflict between the dogs and the wolf they had been buried among the leaves i recollected o'brien's advice and dressed myself in the girl's clothing but i could not make up my mind to go to flushing so i resolved to walk towards the farmhouse which being close to the road would give me a chance of meeting with o'brien i soon arrived there and prowled round it for some time but the doors and windows were all fast and i dared not knock after what the woman had said about her husband's inveteracy to the english at last as i looked round and round quite at a loss what to do i thought i saw a figure at a distance proceeding in the direction of the copse i hastened after it and saw it enter i then advanced very cautiously for although i thought it might be o'brien yet it was possible that it was one of the men who chased the wolf in search of more plunder but i soon heard o'brien's voice and i hastened towards him i was close to him without his perceiving me and found him sitting down with his face covered up in his two hands at last he cried oh pater my poor pater are you taken at last could i not leave you for one hour in safety oh why did i leave you my poor pater simple you were sure enough and that's why i loved you but pater i would have made a man of you for you'd all the materials that's the truth and a fine man too where am i to look for you pater where am i to find you pater you're fast locked up by this time and all my trouble's gone for nothing but i'll be locked up too pater where you are will i be and if we can't go to england together why then we'll go back to that blackguard hole and give it together o'brien oh, oh. spoke no more but burst into tears i was much affected with this proof of o'brien's sincere regard and i came to his side and clasped him in my arms o'brien stared at me who are you you ugly dutch frau for he had quite forgotten the woman's dress at the moment but recollecting himself he hugged me in his arms pater you come as near to an angel's shape as you can for you come in that of a woman to comfort me for to tell the truth i was very much distressed at not finding you here and all the blankets gone to boot what has been the matter i explained in as few words as i could well pater i'm happy to find you all safe and much happier to find that you can be trusted when i leave you for you could not have behaved more prudently now i'll tell you what i did which was not much as it happened i knew that there was no cabaret between us and flushing for i took particular notice as i came along so i took the road to middleburg and found but one which was full of soldiers i passed it and found no other as i came back past the same cabaret one of the soldiers came out to me but i walked along the road he quickened his pace and so did i mine for i expected mischief at last he came up to me and spoke to me in dutch to which i gave him no answer he collared me and then i thought it convenient to pretend that i was deaf and dumb i pointed to my mouth with an oh oh and then to my ears and shook my head but he would not be convinced and i heard him say something about english i then knew that there was no time to be lost so i first burst out into a loud laugh and stopped and on his attempt to force me i kicked up his heels and he fell on the ice with such a rap on the pate that i doubt if he has recovered it by this time there i left him and have run back as hard as i could without anything for pater to feel as little hungry inside with now pater what's your opinion for they say that out of the mouth of babes there is wisdom and although i never saw anything come out of their mouths with sour milk yet perhaps i may be more fortunate this time for pater you're but a baby not a small one o'brien although not quite as large as fingal's babby that you told me the story of my idea is this let us at all hazards go to the farmhouse they have assisted us and may be inclined to do so again if they refuse we must push on to flushing and take our chance well observed o'brien after a pause i think we can do no better so let's be off we went to the farmhouse and as we approached the door we were met by the great mastiff i started back o'brien boldly advanced he's a clever dog and may know us again i'll go up said o'brien not stopping while he spoke and pat his head if he flies at me i shall be no worse than i was before for depend upon it he will not allow us to go back again o'brien by this time had advanced to the dog who looked earnestly and angrily at him he patted his head the dog growled but o'brien put his arm round his neck and, and patting him again whistled to him and went to the door of the farmhouse the dog followed him silently but closely o'brien knocked and the door was opened by the little girl the mastiff advanced to the girl and then turned round facing o'brien as much as to say is he to come in 
the girl spoke to the dog and went indoors during her absence the mastiff laid down at the threshold in a few seconds the woman who had brought us from flushing came out and desired us to enter she spoke very good french and told us that fortunately her husband was absent that the reason why we had not been supplied was that a wolf had met her little girl returning the other day but had been beaten off by the mastiff and that she was afraid to allow her to go again that she heard the wolf had been killed this evening and had intended her girl to have gone to us early to-morrow morning that wolves were hardly known in that country but that the severe winter had brought them down to the lowlands a very rare circumstance occurring perhaps not once in twenty years but how did you pass the mastiff said she that has surprised my daughter and me o'brien told her upon which she said that the english were really this braves no other man had ever done the same so i thought for nothing would have induced me to do it o'brien then told the story of the death of the wolf with all particulars and our intention if we could not do better of returning to flushing i heard that pierre eustace came home yesterday said the woman and i do think that you will be safer at flushing than here for they will never think of looking for you among the casernes which join their cabaret will you lend us your assistance to get in i will see what i can do but are you not hungry about as hungry as men who have eaten nothing for two days mon dieu c'est vrai i never thought it was so long but those whose stomachs are filled forget those who are empty god make us better and more charitable she spoke to the little girl in dutch who hastened to load the table which we hastened to empty the little girl stared at our veracity but at last she laughed out and clapped her hands at every fresh mouthful which we took and pressed us to eat more she allowed me to kiss her until her mother told her that i was not a woman when she pouted at me and beat me off before midnight we were fast asleep upon the benches before the kitchen fire and at daybreak we were roused by the woman who offered us some bread and spirits and then we went out the door where we found the horse and cart all ready and loaded with vegetables for the market the woman the little girl and myself got in o'brien leading as before and the mastiff following we had learnt the dog's name which was achille and he seemed to be quite fond of us we passed the dreaded barriers without interruption and in ten minutes entered the cabaret of eustace and immediately walked into the little room through a crowd of soldiers two of whom chucked me under the chin who should we find there but eustace the pilot himself in conversation with his wife and it appeared that they were talking about us she insisting and he unwilling to have any hand in the business well here they are themselves eustace the soldiers who have seen them come in will never believe that this is their first entry if you give them up i leave them to make their own bargain but mark me eustace i have slaved night and day in this cabaret for your profit if you do not oblige me and my family i no longer keep a cabaret for you madame eustace then quitted the room with her husband's sister and little girl and o'brien immediately accosted him i promise you he said to eustace one hundred louis if you put us on shore at any part of england or on board of any english man-o'-war and if you do it within a week i will make it twenty louis more o'brien then pulled out the fifty napoleons given us by celeste for our own were not yet expended and laid them on the table here is this in advance to prove my sincerity say is it a bargain or not i never yet heard of a poor man who could withstand his wife's arguments backed with one hundred and twenty louis said eustace smiling and sweeping the money off the table i presume you have no objection to start to-night that will be ten louis more in your favour replied o'brien i shall earn them replied eustace the sooner i am off the better for i could not long conceal you here the young frau with you is i suppose your companion that my wife mentioned he has begun to suffer hardships early come now sit down and talk for nothing can be done till dark o'brien narrated the adventures attending our escape at which eustace laughed heartily the more so at the mistake which his wife was under as to the obligations of the family if i did not feel inclined to assist you before i do now just for the laugh i shall have at her when i come back and if she wants any more assistance for the sake of her relations i shall remind her of this anecdote but she's a good woman and a good wife to boot only too fond of her sisters at dusk he equipped us both in sailor's jackets and trousers and desired us to follow him boldly he passed the guard who knew him well what to see already said one you have quarrelled with your wife at which they all laughed and we joined we gained the beach jumped into his little boat pulled off to his vessel and in a few minutes were under way with a strong tide and a fair wind we were soon clear of the scheldt and the next morning a cutter hove in sight we steered for her ran under her lee 
o'brien hailed for a boat and eustace receiving my bill for the remainder of his money wished us success we shook hands and in a few minutes found ourselves once more under the british pennant End of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter twenty six adventures at home i am introduced to my grandfather he obtains employment for o'brien and myself and we join a frigate as soon as we were on the deck of the cutter the lieutenant commanding her inquired of us in a consequential manner who we were o'brien replied that we were english prisoners who had escaped oh midshipmen i presume replied the lieutenant i heard that some had contrived to get away my name sir said o'brien is lieutenant o'brien and if you'll send for steele's list i will have the honour of pointing it out to you this young gentleman is mr peter simple midshipman and grandson to the right honourable lord viscount privilege the lieutenant who was a little snub-nosed man with a pimply face then altered his manner towards us and begged we would step down into the cabin where he offered what perhaps was the greatest of all luxuries to us some english cheese and bottled porter pray said he did you see anything of one of my officers who was taken prisoner when i was sent with dispatches to the mediterranean fleet may i first ask the name of your lively little craft said o'brien the snapper replied the lieutenant och murder sure enough we met him he was sent to verdun but we had the pleasure of his company en route as far as montpelier a remarkably genteel well-dressed young man was he not why i can't say much about his gentility indeed i am not much of a judge as for his dress he ought to have dressed well but he never did when on board of me his father is my tailor and i took him as midshipman just to square an account between us that's exactly what i thought replied o'brien he did not say any more which i was glad of as the lieutenant might not have been pleased at what had occurred when do you expect to run into port demanded o'brien for we were rather anxious to put our feet ashore again in old england the lieutenant replied that his cruise was nearly up and he considered our arrival quite sufficient reason for him to run in directly and that he intended to put his helm up after the people had had their dinner we were much delighted with this intelligence and still more to see the intention put into execution half an hour afterwards in three days we anchored at spithead and went on shore with the lieutenant to report ourselves to the admiral oh with what joy did i first put my foot on the shingle beach at sallyport and then hastened to the post-office to put in a long letter which i had written to my mother we did not go to the admiral's but merely reported ourselves at the admiral's office for we had no clothes fit to appear in but we called at meredith's the tailor and he promised that by the next morning we should be fitted complete we then ordered new hats and everything we required and went to the fountain inn o'brien refused to go to the blue posts as being only a receptacle for midshipmen by eleven o'clock the next morning we were fit to appear before the admiral who received us very kindly and requested our company to dinner as i did not intend setting off for home until i had received an answer from my mother we of course accepted the invitation there was a large party of naval officers and ladies and o'brien amused them very much during dinner when the ladies left the room the admiral's wife told me to come up with them and when we arrived at the drawing-room the ladies all gathered round me and i had to narrate the whole of my adventures which very much entertained and interested them the next morning i received a letter from my mother such a kind one entreating me to come home as fast as i could and bring my preserver o'brien with me i showed it to o'brien and asked him whether he would accompany me why peter my boy i have a little business of some importance to transact which is to obtain my arrears of pay and some prize money which i find due when i have settled that point i will go to town to pay my respects to the first lord of the admiralty and then i think i will go and see your father and mother for until i know how matters stand and whether i shall be able to go with spare cash in my pocket i do not wish to see my own family so write down your address here and you'll be sure i'll come if it is only to square my accounts with you for i am not a little in your debt i cashed a check sent by my father and set off in the mail that night the next evening i arrived safe home but i shall leave the reader to imagine the scene 
to my mother i was always dear and circumstances had rendered me of some importance to my father for i was now an only son and his prospects were very different from what they were when i left home about a week afterwards o'brien joined us having got through all his business his first act was to account with my father for his share of the expenses and he even insisted on paying his half of the fifty napoleons given me by celeste which had been remitted to a banker at paris before o'brien's arrival with a guarded letter of thanks from my father to colonel o'brien and another from me to dear little celeste o'brien had remained with us about a week he told me that he had about one hundred and sixty pounds in his pocket and that he intended to go and see his friends as he was sure that he would be welcome even to father mcgrath i mean to stay with them about a fortnight and shall then return and apply for employment will you like to be again under my protection o'brien i will never quit you or your ship if i can help it spoken like a sensible pater well then i wish promised immediate employment and i will let you know as soon as the promise is performed o'brien took his leave of my family who were already very partial to him and left that afternoon for holyhead my father no longer treated me as a child indeed it would have been an injustice if he had i do not mean to say that i was a clever boy but i had seen much of the world in a short time and could act and think for myself he often talked to me about his prospects which were very different from what they were when i left him my two uncles his elder brothers had died the third was married and had two daughters if he had no son my father would succeed to the title the death of my elder brother tom had brought me next in succession my grandfather lord privilege who had taken no more notice of my father than occasionally sending him a basket of game had latterly often invited him to the house and had even requested some day or another to see his wife and family he had also made a handsome addition to my father's income which the death of my two uncles had enabled him to do against all this my uncle's wife was reported to be again in the family way i cannot say that i was pleased when my father used to speculate upon these chances so often as he did i thought not only as a man but more particularly as a clergyman he was much to blame but i did not then know so much of the world we had not heard from o'brien for two months when a letter arrived stating that he had seen his family and had bought a few acres of land which had made them all quite happy and had quitted with father mcgrath's double blessing with unlimited absolution that he had now been a month in town trying for employment but found that he could not obtain it although one promise was backed up by another a few days after this my father received a note from lord privilege requesting that he would come and spend a few days with him and bring his son peter who had escaped from the french prison of course this was an invitation not to be neglected and we accepted it forthwith i must say i felt rather in awe of my grandfather he had kept the family at such a distance that i had always heard his name mentioned more with reverence than with any feeling of kindred but i was a little wiser now we arrived at eagle park a splendid estate where he resided and were received by a dozen servants in and out of livery and ushered into his presence he was in his library a large room surrounded with handsome bookcases sitting on an easy chair a more venerable placid old gentleman i never beheld his gray hairs hung down on each side of his temples and were collected in a small queue behind he rose and bowed as we were announced to my father he held out two fingers in salutation to me only one but there was an elegance in the manner in which it was done which was indescribable he waved his hand to chairs placed by the gentleman out of livery and requested we would be seated i could not at the time help thinking of mr chucks the boatswain in his remarks upon high breeding which were so true and i laughed to myself when i recollected that mr chucks had once dined with him as soon as the servants had quitted the room the distance on the part of my grandfather appeared to wear off he interrogated me on several points and seemed pleased with my replies but he always called me child after a conversation of half an hour my father rose saying that his lordship must be busy and that he would go over the grounds till dinner-time my grandfather rose and we took a sort of formal leave but it was not a formal leave after all it was high breeding respecting yourself and respecting others for my part i was pleased with the first interview and so i told my father after we had left the room my dear peter replied he your grandfather has one idea which absorbs most others the peerage the estate and the descent of it in the right line as long as your uncles were alive we were not thought of as not being in the line of descent nor should we now but that your uncle william has only daughters still we are not looked upon as actual but only contingent inheritors of the title were your uncle to die to-morrow 
the difference in his behaviour would be manifested immediately that is to say instead of two fingers you would receive the whole hand and instead of one i should obtain promotion to two at this my father laughed heartily saying peter you have exactly hit the mark i cannot imagine how we ever could have been so blind as to call you the fool of the family to this i made no reply for it was difficult so to do without depreciating others or depreciating myself but i changed the subject by commenting on the beauties of the park and the splendid timber with which it was adorned yes peter replied my father with a sigh thirty-five thousand a year in land money in the funds and timber worth at least forty thousand more are not to be despised but god wills everything after this remark my father appeared to be in deep thought and i did not interrupt him we stayed ten days with my grandfather during which he would often detain me for two hours after breakfast listening to my adventures and i really believe was very partial to me the day before i went away he said child you are going to-morrow now tell me what you would like as i wish to give you a token of regard don't be afraid what shall it be a watch and seals or anything you most fancy my lord replied i if you wish to do me a favour it is that you will apply to the first lord of the admiralty to appoint lieutenant o'brien to a fine frigate and at the same time ask for a vacancy as midshipman for me o'brien replied his lordship i recollect it was he who accompanied you from france and appears by your account to have been a true friend i am pleased with your request my child and it shall be granted his lordship then desired me to hand him the paper and ink standish wrote by my directions sealed the letter and told me he would send me the answer the next day we quitted eagle park his lordship wishing my father good-bye with two fingers and to me extending one as before but he said i am pleased with you child you may write occasionally when we were on our route home my father observed that i had made more progress with my grandfather than he had known any one to do since he could recollect his saying that you might write him is at least ten thousand pounds to you in his will for he never deceives any one or changes his mind my reply was that i should like to see the ten thousand pounds but that i was not so sanguine a few days after i return home i received a letter and enclosure from lord privilege the contents of which were as follows my dear child i send you lord blank's answer which i trust will prove satisfactory my compliments to your family yours etc privilege the enclosure was a handsome letter from the first lord stating that he had appointed o'brien to the sanglier frigate and had ordered me to be received on board as midshipman i was delighted to forward this letter to o'brien's address who in a few days sent me an answer thanking me and stating that he had received his appointment and that i need not join for a month which was quite time enough as the ship was refitting but that if my family were tired of me which was sometimes the case in the best regulated families why then i should learn some things of my duty by coming to portsmouth he concluded by sending his kind regards to all the family and his love to my grandmother which last i certainly did not forward in my letter of thanks about a month afterwards i received a letter from o'brien stating that the ship was ready to go out of the harbour and would be anchored off spithead in a few days End of chapter twenty six